Okay, I'm uh, Johnny Taylor. I uh, did a talk last weekend. Some of you were here, some of you were not. I appreciate you um, who came today who weren't here and came last time. That's very nice. Um, we're gonna, like Gary said, kind of do a little review of the conversation last time and then also have some uh, new topics that are on your, your sheet there you've probably looked at. Uh, Gary led us in a prayer already. I had uh, wrote up a small prayer as well, so if you don't mind double dipping tonight, we're just going to say another prayer here real quick. <laughs> I'm sure the Lord won't mind. Lord, guide us in our discussions tonight to be insightful, spirited, and full of your love. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here to celebrate each other's differences and similarities. We ask you to fill our hearts with reception and acceptance. In your name, Jesus, amen. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go over the first foremost sheet here. Um, this is an open discussion to engage the community um, in productive conversation. You're encouraged to ask questions of me if you'd care to. In doing so, please be mindful um, of a couple of simple guidelines that you would find anywhere. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. We'll have a microphone for the people that are going to be using uh, the Zoom or the uh, YouTube to watch it later for your voices to be heard. So please raise your hand to be called to, to, be, uh, to speak. Uh, moderate your questions to be in like a one part idea for time limitations. I'm gonna try and stick to some time uh, conformity tonight, but no promises. Um, don't interrupt others obviously and be courteous. Please have your questions pertaining to the topic at hand. We'll have different sub -top topics tonight to kind of stick in order. Uh, be mindful of your appro appropriateness of your question as well. Take into consideration someone else might feel strongly about the topics we discuss, questions asked, or your opinions. Emotions can run high. So let's embrace ourselves and love one another through this discussion. This is not a debate session, and all emotions are valid here. If you are uncomfortable asking your question out loud, a blank piece of paper has been provided for you to write down your question. Um, I'm not sure if I got the pens handed out or not, but there's, there's some pens to be had somewhere. Um, also, there will be opportunities to write down your questions on pieces of paper downstairs during dinner, and I will be moderating those questions af at a certain point after we've all had some, something to eat. Um, topics for this evening will include our follow-up from October 1st last weekend, being transgender and Christian, Christianity and politics, representing the transgender culture and our responses to the world, utilizing scripture to have victory in what seems to be a world against us, Follow up on some questions I was asked last week. Uh, what gave me strength to transition in faith? What resources were used to empower ourselves? Um, and then a question on minors and gender affirming care. There was also a question about um, people's sexuality in which I made, I thought, a point to say that this discussion was mostly about um, gender expression, not so much um, sexuality, whether you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, so forth. However, I have included in your external resources for information on transgender individuals and LGBTQ plus uh, information right here. There's several um, wonderful resources here, but the top two, um, the top one's more resource towards transgender care, medical care by the University of Utah. The second one is a BBC, um, British uh, Broadcasting Company. Uh, the gender biases that shape our brains. And that kind of goes into um, gender expression and identity, but the University of Utah also has a lot of references to what it means to be each part of the sector of the LGBTQ plus A. Um, so please feel free to invest time into checking that out. Um, let's see. Um, we're gonna be talking about our, our new topics, our uh, general questions for the speaker. We're gonna try and be a little bit more open tonight if and there are any questions to just really be bold and be brave and ask them if you feel, if you feel like doing so. Um, understanding our elders and bridging the gap between LGBT and the generations. The 1% versus the 99%, uh, the 1% being what we don't have in common, uh, the 99% what we do have in common, or maybe the other way around. What can we learn from each other is the idea. And then I was also provoked last, after last weekend to talk about non-believers and believers and how this talk can kind of 
orchestrate itself into a realm of what does this mean to a non-believer, a non-Christian, or somebody of a different faith? And I also expressed in the talk last um, weekend that it was a talk about Christianity and being transgender. So it was solely really resourced to just that niche right there. So I will apologize if that was misconstrued in any way or if there was some type of um, dropping of the ball to make sure that that was first and foremost that we knew that we were talking about myself, my journey being a Christian, as in a follower of Jesus, of faith, and my transition in that, um, and how being a Christian and being transgender seems to kind of butt heads. So um, I will still stick to that this evening. This is a, a talk about Christian fellowship and transgender and LGBTQ+. A. That's not to say there aren't plenty of resources for folks who identify in a different way or feel that this church might not represent their uh, culture, their religion, or what they specifically believe in. So I encourage everybody to just you know, keep, uh, keep open in your resources and make sure your resources are valuable and good places to be reading things. And um, we're just going to stick to the code. So um, we're going to start with that. I do want to go over this external resources here really quick. Um, there was a gentleman that came last week who was a trans, is, excuse me, is a transgender pastor from uh, Richland. And he was so kind to bring um, wonderful resources I had no clue about. I'm not much of a reader to be open and honest about that. So the following um, resources underneath my QR codes and things here are the information that he's brought to the table, which blew me out of the water and was just a very fantastic um, addition to the resources I provided and the speeches. So um, it's, it's something I, I included as well with a reference to him to thank him for his work. Um, but that's also an, uh, a reference. Part of it was given out last weekend. And then uh, the new one that I added on there was specifically towards um, transgender uh, stories and books of interest and so forth for, for education. and. Um, you know, things like addressing issues of whether God condemns lesbians and gays in scripture and so forth. Um, so do make note of that if you want to go check out those things, they're there for you. Pass off. Okay, so in a light review of what we spoke of last Sunday, we had a lot of topics and honestly, I kind of blacked out and just enjoyed myself. So <laughs> I, don't really, I don't really specifically remember um, uh, all, my, all my topics and I think it's, it's not necessarily important to rehash so much, but um, mostly the, the topics included um, my journey as being a transgender Christian, uh, the long road of understanding myself and my journey, uh, growing up Catholic, growing up in a conformed society. Um, my mom had a very prestigious job and so did my father and we were very well known in town. Um, luckily that's kind of fading out with the generations, but. Um, I was held to a very high standard to be appropriate and to be what I was told to be all the time. And, and what, I, what I could conclude as comfortable for me made other people very uncomfortable. And that was kind of a, a very, um, I don't want to use the word condemning necessarily so much, but a very challenging way to grow up, to imagine yourself as a young child um, and you, you really find a fondness to a certain toy or a certain color or a certain pair of pants that you like and, and everything you feel is right for yourself, you're told constantly, you know, you're making people feel uncomfortable and the first thing you need to do in life is to make other people feel comfortable. That was a rule I grew up with. And a lot of that had to do with social structure and this was also the 80s and 90s. So um, being transgender, obviously has been a thing um, around in our, our world, but not necessarily so much our personal culture in America up until um, recent times when it's kind of grasped some asphalt and taken off. So um, as a young person, I didn't really have, uh, uh, you could say idols, I suppose, or people that I could look up to, similar to um, people of different ethnicity, ethnicities not being in commercials on TV or in um, you know, playing certain roles on TV that they're 
uh, projected to play, such as the Hispanic lady would always play the maid or something like that. I was always kind of shoved in this box of conformity that made no sense to me. And I think as a child, you almost have more insight as, than a person who's been around the world and, and has been told what to do and is conforming to that. Your, your childlike self is the most innocent creature you can be. And the further along we get, I think we lose that because we say, okay, I have to do this to fit in, or I have to do this to be accepted. And our number one thing of, of all of us is that we need to be accepted, we need to be loved, we need to be shown we're loved, uh, cared for outwardly, not just uh, at the family reunion, you give each other a hug and, oh, hey, how are you, this and that, but a, a in-depth sense of this is who I am and I want to be loved for it, no matter what it is. So it's a little bit of my journey, um, finding churches and finding uh, what I call a safe place to sit. Uh, I've been through a lot of different churches, a lot of different houses of the Lord, and felt um, accepted up until a point. Like, I'd be accepted unless people knew about me, then I'd be ostracized. So it was very much, you know, having to hide who you are without falsifying who you are, which is a really interesting structure if you think about it. So. Um, some things that are hard to explain to allies, people that um, support us as LGBTQ+, A, and are, are helping us to become more visible and helping us to become more mainstream, um, it's very hard to describe to somebody uh, those feelings. And when you're a person that fits in and you feel comfortable in the body you're in and the gender you've been assigned at birth, then it's very similar to not being able to uh, to tell somebody their job or tell somebody their personality or something of that extent. Um, it's very difficult to just feel like yourself inside and then not be represented outside like that. And then when you do try to represent yourself, you're cast aside or you're not good enough or you're not, um, you don't belong or you don't even have the ability to exist without somebody trying to hurt you or trying to do something negative against you. Um, I'm very new to this church. Uh, I've only been here about a year, a little bit, maybe over a year now. And I've really come to a sense of belonging here. And I hope and I encourage all of you to try to find that little niche in your life where you feel you belong and you feel, uh, whether it's Christ-based or family-based or fellowship-based, that you're welcomed uh, at 100%, not 99%. So uh, the childhood adversity uh, the sense of belonging, the perseverance that it took to get through it, and the perception of myself in comparison to other children was always something that was very on the forefront of my mind. And watching other people simply just be able to get along and, and, and you know, you watch other kids not judge each other but want to be friends, and then no one really wants to be friends with you because you're the girl that wears boys' clothes or you're always, you know, uh, harassed about that or, people question what bathroom you're supposed to be in. It's all the way down to using the restroom. It's uncomfortable. And so it's very important to have um, people such as yourselves to come and learn and be open about learning about other people's journeys. And uh, I applaud you for that. Um, are there any questions about early childhood or early church experiences or um, anything that pertains to that topic necessarily that would be of interest to anybody? I like that. That's that's good. <laughs> you have to give us more time. <laughs> Get out, Gary. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to make sure this time to stop and pause for people's reflections and give people time to digest the information. Um, and uh, yeah. So, so Gary. Yes, wonderful question. I'll repeat it for people on Zoom uh, via the microphone. The question was, what age did I transition, um, whether it be in school or, or otherwise? It's, it's a multifaceted question and a multifaceted answer. So I, I honestly came out when I was about four years old. I, I was resonating with a different person within myself from the person I was uh, cultivated to be, if you will. I was adopted into my family at, at a year and a half and already felt very out of place. So um, one thing I very much knew about myself was who I was, even as a very young person. Um, I, 
If I was very much more savvy at PowerPoint and et cetera, I'd love to have a, a visual aid of myself on my first communion wearing a white dress versus myself in my Batman gear um, at Christmas because a, a picture tells a thousand words. And um, any time I felt I had to wear feminine clothing of any sort, and we're talking, I could be wearing a blue shirt, but if it had just a little bit of feathering or riffles, or I don't know how to talk about female attire, um, anything feminine at all, or a pair, pair of pants was too tight or something of the sort, it would put me in misery zone. And I would get into this funk that I couldn't explain to my parents, and they would know I was upset, but I couldn't verbalize that. And it was one of those structural things where it's like, this is what you're supposed to do, so just do it. And if you do it, then you'll be fine. So long story very short, I physically transitioned at 28. This was after coming out as, as being lesbian as the only option for several 20 years or so. I came out as, as a, a lesbian in seventh grade, um, much dismayed to my parents. Um, but so there's, it's different because sometimes uh, people in my generation, transgender wasn't an option. There was no people out there that I saw that were transgender. There was no um, media representation. Um, there was no uh, celebrity representation. There was nobody down the block that I knew that was transgender. It just wasn't a thing. So the first step, of course, is to identify where you sit in yourself. And what was available to me was identifying with uh, being a lesbian. So, um, and in that category, there's different categories of lesbians, how you, how you dress, how you um, personify yourself as, there's lipstick lesbian, there's butch lesbian. So I was very much, um, in prison, I would have been called the stud because I was, <laughs> I was very much, as much of a man as I could be while still being forced to be female. So as I grew older, um, I push the limits with myself. And I, I would encourage anybody that considers themselves transgender to do so as well. Because the very important part is you want to make sure you're making a cognitive decision for the rest of your life. And not to say it's, it's um, unheard of to detransition or that it's not OK to detransition. That's very OK. But I pushed myself. I, for a couple years, tried to wear makeup, tried to wear tighter clothes, tried to represent myself in a different way. And it was mostly because I was sick of getting rocks thrown at me on the street and getting kicked out of bathrooms. And I wanted to be as attractive as I could be while not getting harassed anymore. I, I lived a life of utter harassment and torture as a child from the outside world. And so I, in my early 20s, decided, I think I know where I want to go, but I'm going to really test these waters and make sure you, you don't want to order a foot-long sub without knowing you want to eat it, you know? So you just, you have to make decisions to push yourself in, in any realm. That, that's when you go to college, you got to make sure that degree is right for you. And if it's not, switch it. You got to make sure that if the route you're trying to get to the workplace is not the fastest route, you switch it. It could be considered in, in many realms of the world, but um, physically had top surgery at 28. And so I was a full-grown person then and, and had tried the other half of the street, did my best with that, and really resonated with, with what I was at the time. I, I performed drag for 10 years as Johnny Angel. And I ended up legally adopting that name because drag allowed me to be the person I knew I was once a month. I could wear whatever I wanted to wear. I could put facial hair on. <laughs> Luckily now, the good Lord's given me a little <laughs> more to work with. but. Uh, I could put on any facial hair I wanted to. I could wear whatever I wanted to, and people loved me, and they cherished me for that person. So as I went through more stages of transition, which was name change and how I wanted to be addressed and, and the things I wanted to do for my inner person and for my business person was to make sure that whatever name I chose for myself was meaningful. And part of Johnny Angel was that persona that's always been in me since I was like very young, like three, you know? And the closer I got to that person I could be, I realized, ooh, epiphany, that's me, here I am. So I, I dedicated 
the rest of my life to being Johnny still, too, because he gave me the courage to uh, allow myself to resonate with who I was. So uh, family knew forever when I transitioned. People were like, finally, we can stop calling you a girl. You know, and I'm like, well, thanks. I hated it anyway. Um, so uh, to answer your question, there are several parts to it, you know self-identifying as a young child, which we should all be allowed to do, um, recognizing who I was as I got older, testing the boundaries of who I thought I was to make sure, crossing that boundary in the drag world, becoming more comfortable with myself, and being able to finally live the lifestyle that I feel blessed and favored in. So, yeah. I'm a long-winded person, so be careful with your questions. <laughs> Anybody else in that realm? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, I don't mean to like, downplay anything that you experienced because it's obviously you were like, discriminated against, but kind of, you know, from my own life experience, there were kind of like an analyzed case like males or female is more like their interest. People are very hostile against them. It's just kind of harder for like a man, a, a woman who wants to start what is dressing to look more masculine to start dressing more feminine. So my kind of understanding is like, what I'm trying to describe is like, when you start I, so I dressed masculine from day one. You know, when I was a little kid, I threw exorbitant fits. And it was deal with the fit or let this damn kid wear what he wants, you know. So I wore masculine clothes from, since I was very young. And I would steal my brother's clothes if I didn't have the clothes I wanted. Um, even to the extent where I would wear what my mom would put me in to get to school, and I'd wear the clothes I put in my backpack when I got there. So, but people always kicked me out of the bathroom. They always said, you're in the wrong bathroom. I had a security guard at the Denver Art Museum chase me down the hallway with my mother, who said, ma'am, you can't let your young, young son use the restroom in the women's restroom. And she looked at him and she said, this is my daughter. And it was those points where I was kind of like, shit, really? You know, I have to be told, this, you don't have to tell them I'm your daughter. You know, I'm, I'm trying to live this role, right? And it, it's been a lifelong affliction. Um, when I started dressing more feminine, of course, then I had men coming after me, women coming after me, and it was like, okay, well, I've passed the, passed the test. I'm now attractive to everybody, and I don't get harassed anymore. I get asked out all the time. But then it's like, well, I don't want to deal with that either. So um, when I finally was able to have mail on all my certificates and all my dressings as far as you know, social code goes, IDs, certif you know, the birth certificate, et cetera, et cetera, that's when I finally felt like I could do things and, and represent my full self without even having a question. And since even before transition, people thought I was a boy. I was on the boys' baseball team when I was younger. I had girls chasing me all over the place. It was heaven, you know. Puberty hit and all downhill. But um, I'm not sure how to answer that very well other than I, I do agree. I think what you're saying is that sometimes men who want to transition to being female have a harder time due to their physical dispositions. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's very much a thing. And that's our, our duty as a culture to start being more sensitive and using our ocular perception. If I can't identify this person's gender, then I shall be genderless as well. I shall not say, yes ma'am, yes sir. It's, how can I help you? Is there something you're looking for? And leave it at that, you know? It's, um, it's something that I think people are working very much hard to try and uh, um, switch how they're speaking and be more aware of people's disposition in this world that there isn't just two genders. In fact, there are several genders and all of them are okay. So it's, I do agree that I have several, now I have several friends who are um, transgendered females and I see their struggle. 
as a barber, I worked on a younger fella who I thought actually was a transphobic person at first, and I had a very hard time getting along with him. Well, it turns out he was going through his own journey, and he came out as transgender and fully transitioned and is now not suicidal, went get back to school, has his beautiful hair grown out that I used to cut ever so short, and it's things like that where I then had to work on myself when this person transitioned to, in my books, change the name. In my books, make a note. This is not this person anymore, this is this person. In my phone, change it too. And then when they would call, remember, because their voice was still quite in a low register, I knew who I was talking to. But I need to make sure that my natural brain doesn't tell me I'm registering a male's voice so I will react to a male, right? So it's, it's work, it's so much hard work. But I do feel, in some ways, that's an accurate statement. Um, as genetic females, most of the time we have uh, hips that we have to hide. Our shoes are size five. Try buying a cowboy boot in size five men's. It don't exist, baby. No, it don't. So um, the struggle's real, for sure, in that realm. Does that adequately answer your question? OK. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? OK, lovely. Let's move on. Um, politics in our culture and how we reflect the dangers of politics dictating our existence and the abilities to have medical, medical coverage as minors and adults. I want to kind of revert back to the question I got asked last Sunday. An uh, individual asked me at what age I felt was appropriate for minors to have surgery for gender reaffirming care. And I was really like, Ugh, uh, that's so difficult. And I think I stumbled through it adequately, but um, I'm going to be short and simple on it. This decision is between a very well-educated person who does the surgeries, who does it for a living, who knows the demographics of people who back out and has the statistics to say this, this person at whatever age falls into the category of being potentially um, a person that might not resonate with the surgery. This means that there is, of course, statistics that say that certain people that go in for certain surgeries will then back out of the surgery. And that can be concise with a certain age group. I don't have those demographics. That's just uh, it is kind of an assumption I'm making that people hopefully should have that kind of information out there. Um, the parents need to be first and foremost in this in their relationship with their child. How well do you know your child? How well does your child make cognitive decisions? Is your child uh, of, of an age where they understand the implications of surgery and the things that can happen during surgery and what recovery is like? It's, it's not all fun and games. I had a surgery that almost killed me. I had, uh, had to have an emergency surgery after a low blood pressure for several days right after my surgery, uh, my chest surgery. And it brought to my attention the extreme danger of getting re reconstructive or plastic surgery or any surgery, any surgery at all. Um, that that um, choice should be uh, solely between a very well-educated and renowned doctor, parents, and a cognitive child that knows who they are and the, and, and the ramifications of surgery. And um, I support it, but I support it under very limited conditions. And this is just my opinion. It has literally nothing to do with our society or what you should or shouldn't do or what your family should or shouldn't do. It's about education, and it's about uh, knowing each other well. Um, that being said, our politics are saying otherwise. So we have a lot of. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say lightly problems with people who want to dictate other people's lives and want to um, say who, who, can get, um, who can get what surgeries, when, how. And there are certain states that have passed some laws that say a, a person that um, uh, believes that they're transgender needs to live that lifestyle for up to three years before being able to have reconstructive surgery or gender affirming surgeries. I want to say, well, I don't remember what state it is, so I won't lie. It's on the East Coast somewhere. And, and I, I heard that and I said, you know, there's a little value to that. You know, we don't want to be rushing into decisions. We don't want to be um, doing things based on um, impulsive action. But I would also beg to say that 
people that are in my position have thought about it for quite some time. And it's usually not an impulsive decision, and it's usually something that's well-developed and well-cared for and, and nurtured in the family that that person feels that way. And so it shouldn't be an impulsive decision, but we should also, I don't believe, have anything that says in our law books or, or our rule books for our constitutional rights that we're unable to provide care for people that know who they are, that deserve it just as much as I do at, at 28 or, or 38 or however old I want to tell you that I am. Um, 28, we'll go with 28, that sounds good. Um, we need to make sure that we're voting. We need to make sure that we're um, really trying to work through resourcing who's up on the ballots, resourcing what these people believe in. Because you might believe in one structure of what they want to pass and say, hey, that's, that's not a bad idea. But looking at the little nitty gritty stuff, we could be electing somebody that believes in the persecution or execution of certain types of people. And that goes for any of our historical pasts. We've seen what's happened in the Holocaust. We've seen what's happened in uh, Uganda right now with the laws passed against homosexuality that are absolutely absurd and have nothing to do with homosexuality in the slightest most of the time, but abuse of other people. Abuse of other people should be outlawed uh, directly, but in doing so, don't abuse other people in your opinion that they're not allowed to do things either. So um, we need to be very, um, as we have an upcoming election, I'm sweating over this, trying to tell people vote, 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 vote locally federally, state, it's very important because they're coming after our libraries, they're coming after our resources for our youngsters to have available curriculum provided to them when they can't get it otherwise. It's very important to be able to have our libraries stay open and, and have provocative material in them that should bother everybody because all of our opinions are valid and all of our belief systems are valid. You can't, you can't put and Frank's diary on the chopping block and have Mein Kampf running free. That's not acceptable to me. And that's what's happening right now. Anne Frank's diary is in the banned books club. Mein Kampf is not. Think about that. What is fair to say who deserves what coverage and the ability to access treatments? How current laws are being passed or attempted to be passed will hurt literally everybody. There's several categories of individuals who deserve to have constructive, reconstructive surgeries on their bodies that have nothing to do with being transgender. There are people born with deformities. There are people born with um, adverse uh, physical sexual markers. You know, we have people that need these surgeries for life-saving uh, resources to be able to live in our society without even being LGBTQ plus A. We have women that want to have their breasts enlarged. Well, that would adversely affect them to be able to do so. We have gentlemen that have testicular problems that would not be able to get testosterone. That's gender affirming care. So these are things we need to think about and remind people that are not very educated on what they're passing that it will affect their culture too. The straight cis culture will be affected by these laws. And they think they're coming after us, but they're biting their own tail. So it's very good to be educated on who all will be affected by these, these situations. Um, and does this follow a Christian viewpoint of loving one another, or even a non-Christian viewpoint, I'm going to go there even though I said I wasn't going to, of a humanitarian effort to make sure that people are taken care of in our communities, and our families, and otherwise? How is reducing care in a healthcare field loving each other? How is that in any way, shape, or form, saying, I support you as an individual, no matter who you are. I love you and your body and your, your position in your body. Um, we, we need to make sure that if we're not coming from a Christian perspective, um, we're coming from a humanitarian perspective where, where people are, are valued at being a human being, not a label, not a gender, not an associate, not something that's a conglomerated group of people we can just rid of when we don't feel like serving them anymore. That's not the Christian, that's not the Christian heart, nor should it be um, anything of value to people that, that love and care for each other, even if I don't know you. I don't want you to go through hardship or pain. I help people that, that don't deserve it because I still want them to be able to have opportunities to better themselves. And 
even though somebody might come against me in my culture, my transgender, I would still say to them, well, I really hope that your wife gets those breast enhancements this month. Because if that's what makes you happy, then I'm, I'm about it, you know? I'm not so prideful to say I don't support people that don't support me. I will still support you even if you don't support me because that's the standpoint I take in my culture. I won't be the guy that's gonna be speaking negatively about other people because I don't feel like that produces what we're supposed to be doing either. If you want respect, you have to give it as well. And we really need to work on starting to give people that don't deserve it a little bit of respect to try to understand where they come from more. That sounds really convoluted and super hard, and granted it is, but if I can do it with my grandmother, anybody can, so. Um, it was brought to my attention that I referred to God as he, him last Sunday. And that's something I, I had thought about, and I was like, hmm, I'm going to touch base on it just, just for a moment, because I do think it's, it's an important thing to talk about in our cultures as we're trying to become more inclusive. Um, Gary introduced me to the Inclusive Bible. Is that the accurate name of that? Okay, thank you. Um, and also since the talks and since um, I've been talking with people I don't even know, they're like, have you heard of the Inclusive Bible? I said, gosh, yeah, it just, it just popped up on my radar about a week and a half ago, something I'm going to buy and try to do a little bit of reading in. Um, but I also really want to say whatever you're comfortable with is okay. You know, if you want to refer to God as an entity of a father in heaven, a mother in heaven, whatever works for you, honestly, is wonderful. If you don't vibe with Christianity, you don't vibe with God, then you don't have to worry about it. But I also was, from a transgender brother of mine, was, had brought that up to me. And he said, you know, we're trying to be more inclusive in our scripture, and we're trying to be more inclusive in this. And I just kept noticing that you're referring to God as him. And I said, Ugh. okay, let me think on that. Is that something I'm, I could change or I'm willing to change? My opinion on it is, what's the focal point? Are we, fo are we focusing on gender again, or are we focusing on God? And the main point is that we need to be focusing on God, focusing on scripture, and how to use scripture and our faith to be able to um, surpass difficulties, use scripture to empower us, I did feel slightly bad about it, though, because here I am asking to be called the gender I resonate with, and then having somebody say, well, maybe God doesn't want to be called him. And I'm like, oh, all these points. OK. So I want, to, I want to be sensitive to that. And I'm going to make a pledge to work on that, because I do feel it's important. But I also feel like if whatever gets you there works for you, it's OK. And it's okay to refer to God as mother, father, whatever you want. Every, every transcription is different. Every, um, every era has a different viewpoint, and they're all valid. So I will probably continue to refer to God as him. Growing up in the Catholic Church, that was what it was. He was our father in heaven. And for me, that's what's comfortable. And being adopted, that always really resonated with me big time because I didn't always get along with my adopted parents. And the one thing I had that the church gave me was a father in heaven that I could always make proud or structurize my thinking to say, I have one parent out there, and I never thought of God as a female. My dad would always nag us. My dad was not religious. He'd say, well, God's a female. God's a female. And at my youth, I was like, no, he is not. You know, like, <laughs> I was always really frustrated. My dad loved to poke the bear, and he knew that that one would, would get us. And so I, I now think back about my, my earthly father and how smart he was. Uh, but I just want to say, for anybody that took that in a, in a way that felt non-inclusive, that I apologize for that. But I also feel like we're all just doing our best. So um, moving on. Um, one huge topic I want to touch on that, that is kind of in the now in our church right now is um, understanding our elders. And this goes right back to talking about my dad. So one thing I noticed when I first got to this church was this church was mainly made up of an older population. 
And upon entry, I was like, okay, I'm bald, but I'm the youngest one here. <laughs> What's going on? Why is, there, why is there no youth here? Why is there, why is there this huge, and I'm talking Moses water, huge uh, division of youth and elders, maybe here, but maybe elsewhere too, I'm not sure. Um, the last church I came from was a very diverse group of people, but it was like 300 people every Sunday. So there was every, a smorgasbord of people there, which I thought was delightful. And I walked in here and I was kind of like, oh gosh, maybe, wait, what's going on here? There's all this pride stuff here. Everybody's inclusive. I want to say that all of you are like really good people, but I'm a little skeptical as to why there's no youth here. And, but I stuck it out, and I was like, I just want to see. I'm going to test these waters, because I gave every other church a chance for like a year and a half, and there was no reason to not give this one a year and a half as well. So I've sat here for about a year, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, about a year, I think. And I've realized that the, there is no gap. There's literally no gap here in this house for people that are of a certain generation that were raised a certain way, that were raised in certain cultural um, standards, if you will, of the 40s, 50s, 60s, that were very genderized and very monotone when it came to diversity or inclusion. It didn't exist. So that's one thing we have to think about is it didn't exist. And not only that, but being gay was illegal. So we have to, I really want to wrap up that, um, I'm kind of compounding here a little bit, sorry. Um, there doesn't have to be that thought of when you walk into a room of people and you see a bunch of elders as a, a queer person or as an LGBTQ plus A person that you have to be afraid or that there's gonna be some undertone. I was worried here there was gonna be an undertone of inclusion but, inclusion but, inclusion but, and I've not found the but yet. So that sounded weird, sorry. <laughs> um, Finding Nemo, let's go with it that way. Let's go with it that way, sorry. Um, my grandmother was a devout Mormon and I was always worried as a young person going through so many different changes in my life that eventually those changes would exclude people or the changes I've made would exclude me from that person in a different way of speaking. Um, that was another place I never found exclusion though. And that was one of my first elders that I knew was devout religious and was Mormon on top of that, but still always loved me, asked me questions. She would always call my girlfriend my friend. Oh, where's your friend today, you know? And, but she was always invested in me and invested in whatever it was I was doing. My, my drag show, she'd call my dancing. How is your dancing going? She was a dancer and a singer when she was younger, so she was always very enthusiastic that I was, um, well, maybe not representing her type of dance, but um, dancing all the same. I never told her how I danced, but anyway. Um, the one thing I, I really would want to ask of, of you here if you want to respond, is um, what do you feel would better our culture as far as our elders and our, let's say, youthful LGBTQ plus A individuals, what would better that relationship? Or how can we, how can we remove our stigma of our elders or our LGBTQ plus A uh, friends, family, and associates from feeling like there's always going to be some kind of friction there. So I guess that was kind of a complex multi-question. Um, what can we do to learn more about each other? Does anybody have any, any thoughts on that? And that could just be ask questions, be involved, uh, remove your biases before, before talking to anybody. Does anybody have a tool that they've used before to break the ice with somebody that they felt very not um, on the same page with? I try to make some kind of connection. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And there's the south side, there's the north side, mm -hmm. there's all the, the German town, you know. 
Yeah. And, and they've kept, Chicago has kept some of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But if, if I am talking to somebody new, I just try to, you know, listen to them as they're talking and introducing themselves and then try to pick up on I love it. Exactly. So finding the 1% that you have in common. One thing I cultivated as I was a, a barber struggling to get along with people, as you might imagine, barbering is very glamorous. Um, I basically described it as every, every half hour you have a stranger walking through the door. You have about 30 seconds between they've walked through the threshold of your door and they're in your chair. My job is to not only produce the haircut they're looking for, but to socialize, engage, and to find something to engage about. And when I first started my barbering journey, it was very much in, um, together with my Christian journey, my renewed faith Christian journey. And I came up with the concept of the 1% and the 99. And this is not the, the billionaire concept, by the way. Um, one thing I tried to do, if I knew somebody was coming into the shop, that I just was like, here's this person. Oh, gosh darn it. I got to figure out how to like this person today. I got to figure out this half hour I got to be with this person. I would really start with ocular perception. What's, what do they got on? What's going on today? How are their, how's their disposition? How are they holding themselves? And I watched a show one time. This is off kilter a little bit. Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> Bear with me, hot second, just bear with me here. The one thing that she did that I learned from so much was she deals with people that are hurting, that have maybe physical deformities, and they're there to get care taken, and they're there to solve the problem. And the worst thing you could do is make it worse, or to say something that might be taken negatively. So I just love her to death. She walks in the door. I'm gonna play pretend here. Ah, Gerald. Well, what are you doing here today? You look great. You don't need me. What does that do? It wide opens the conversation for trust and acceptance, where you can say, oh, man, you know, I just love that blouse you have on today, or that, that color just makes your, your eyes pop. Oh, you just look wonderful. And I started implementing that into my career, where somebody would come in, and I'm like, oh, ooh, this hair. But I got to go, ooh. You know, as a bald person, I just really love that you have this much hair. <laughs> and I really love that I only have half an hour to figure this out. But it was one of those things where we can use that 99% of how we don't get along and we don't see eye to eye and we don't have anything together as fuel to the fire. We can, we can just be dousing that fire with that oil and saying, oh, well, let it burn. To hell with it. Who cares? Or we can switch it around and say, there's something about this person, even if I have to fabricate something, I'm not a liar, but I can be a fabricator, to say, gosh, it's, it's, it's Gary again. Oh, Gary, gotta deal with Gary. Now, Gary, you know what? I wish I had a pair of pants like those. Those are real nice. They look durable. <laughs> okay, too much fabrication. Okay, too much fabrication. Rein it in a little bit. Um, I could use anything against this person. Their nas nasty attitude, how they treat me at work, how they complain about my signs or my music or something that's benign and has nothing to do with me. Um, or I can say, I'm going to control this situation and I'm going to make this person know that I'm putting my best foot forward to try and engage with them on a cordial level and I'm going to put pleasantries right out there first and they're going to see how much effort I'm putting into it in an organic way. You never want it to be forced because you don't want to be faking it or being a weirdo or something, but you want to make sure that with intellect and care, you're taking care of people you don't know. And that opens the engagement possibilities. Gardening. I'm not great at gardening, but what can you teach me about it? Well, there we go. Boom. We're automatically getting along. So with our elders, we have to remember the time frame in which they come from can't be held against them. That's something that we engage in a lot with our, our society because we have a lot of times where we see our elders as unable to
to understand us or are unable to grasp the concept of being transgender or something like that, or queer even. I've had people say, well, I support you, but I, gosh, I just don't understand it. I say, well, you know what? I could take that two ways. I could go, well, you should learn to try to understand it, or you should work harder. Or I can say, hey, that's all right. You don't understand it. Is there anything I can help you to understand? You know, it's the, you don't want to have a defense mechanism right away. You want to be able to be open and to keep your doors open to conversation and to not have your hurt on your sleeve, but have your heart on your sleeve. So when you're asked a question that might be like, I got to bite my tongue to respond to that, you know, utilize your intellect and your heart to be able to say, this is how I should probably propose the answer. So it's digestible, so people can understand it. Um, oftentimes, I feel like our elders are misunderstood. And I won't name out loud on YouTube who I'm talking about, but I had an elder in my family that was incredibly hard to get along with. And as they've gotten older, and I've gotten older, it's given me a chance to learn about their history. As a child, I was always like, why in the world are you so awful? But as an adult, I go, oh, that's why you were so awful. Your mother was awful. Your father was awful. Your grandparents lived through the Depression. You had nothing to eat. You had bath water for eight children that you reused for two weeks in a row because you didn't have sustainable water. You know, I always wondered why my grandfather had a kind of a, a must to him all the time. And my dad finally told me, as a sad story, that they reused their wash water for eight children and the family for weeks on end. My father had to take a bath once a week with his three siblings in the, in the bucket out back. They had no hot water. We were not so far away from the troubles of our society that created hard people. And if we choose to not understand that realm of our elders, where you have to, you have to give them a break. We can't expect people to understand us right away, just as we don't give them the opportunity to be understood. So I grew up in a, in a, in a family with some people that had some extreme hardships that were wonderful people, and some people that had extreme hardships that were absolute mm, awful. And I've learned to love both sides, because I can say, it's not your fault that you had this abuse in your family. It's not your fault that that abuse has now come through you in a way that you can't understand how to do anything else with it. And you use it as momentum to make yourself feel powerful and to put other people down or to use it in a negative sense of a way that discourages other people from liking you or wanting to know you. That's honestly, we just have to make a point to try to understand people better. And that's, I think, what's going to bridge our gap between our elders and our communities as young, younger folks or LGBTQ+. A. We have to understand that these people come from a completely different time frame where, I mean, we can go back and look at the Andy Griffith show for a great example. That was like a model of what, what was supposed to happen back then. And that was a groundbreaking show at, at the most because there was no mother. Single father raising his son with Aunt B. So we have to think of these times and go, OK, when I'm, when I'm feeling hard about somebody's reaction to me or hard about somebody's disposition that might be an elder in my community, let me think about what they've been through. Let me think about the cultural appropriation they had to go through. And they didn't have the options that we have to change things. Change was not something that happened back in the day unless it was from somebody with great power or great disposition in our culture. And they influenced culture, and they influenced change. But the times weren't so much that a wife could stand up and say, I don't feel comfortable about my husband beating me on the weekends, or something like that. Where these days, we, we have the power as, as people with more of a voice and individual power to say, this isn't right. This needs to change. And it happens with people behind us and the right type of people beside us. So we have a whole group of people that had projected issues on them from the Depression, the war time, lack of food, lack of warmth, lack of security. You take a person that grew up in a, a sense of no security, and they will continue to be a person that has a sense of no security. 
all through their life unless it's provided for them the space to change that. And it can be changed. We all have our book written for us, but we all can make the choice to flip the page and to move on and to carry on. Trauma in the past does not have to live today, and we can be that sense of change for our elders to say, you know, I want to give you a little space on what you just said to me because I understand you come from a different generation. And start with that because that will give people the gratitude to say, I love you and I want you to feel whole and welcome with me. Whether you feel that way with the person down the street or your brother or your sister or your whoever, that's, that's whatever. With me, you will always feel welcome in whatever place you come from. And when we have a hard moment, we'll be strong enough to work through it as good friends and as people that can associate the 1% and turn it to that 99. Because that's the goal, is to not let that 1% be the divisive character that guts us all so we're all sitting around looking stupid. You know, we're, we just need to do it. So anyway, that's enough of that. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on, on the 1% of the 99? Yes. So I'm originally from Virginia. OK. Mm-hmm. Yes, I have family from Virginia. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yes. Very, very beautiful point. My father was the same way where he eventually told me, I've never understood anything you've done. And you never listened to me. So I don't know how to, how to help you. I don't know how to support you. But as I've gotten older and things have progressed between us as a father-son relationship, we're, we're tight now, you know, and he, he now understands once he's given me the space to grow and I've given him the space to grow, to say, well, you might not understand it and I might not even be able to tell you about it. You know, I can't always uh, decipher my own feelings or, or, or tell people what it's like. Um, they have to give themselves enough time and space to step back from, from their projections and say, well, I do know somebody like that. They're not a pedophile. They're not a creep. They're not weird. They're not a freak. That's not on mistake. This person's very intentional on in who they are. And if not more intentional than most of the people that I know that walk the street just going to work every day. You know, so we, that's, that's a very wonderful point. And I'm glad that that's happening for you because that's not always the case. And in, in saying so, there are some people that we have to just say, we can no longer engage. And, and that's your healthy boundary to have, to say, you know what, I gave it my best. Um, I'd like to maybe come back to this at some time, if you're willing to do so in a couple years, when we both had time to grow and learn about each other. Because hurt people hurt people. And if you got somebody that's on that realm, that's watching that dang darn Fox News and all that MAGA garbage, then you're going to have a hard person to to talk to. My biological family is from Virginia, Alabama, and some of us don't talk. And I've said, that's OK. And years later, well, it's smoothed out a little bit. You know, you got to give people time to, to find the right resources and to be um, educated. And honestly, when you're, when you're acting so foolish as to say those things without any physical representation and going to church where most of the people are, are 
having pedophilia issues in clergy, and you're indoctrinating your children into baptism before they know what baptism is or the, what God is or that they take the Lord and, as their savior, then uh, how are they on the right side of the street? Uh, we, we're, not, we're not, the indoctrination stuff has got me all riled up because you've got people that are baptizing babies and wh where's, where's the common sense there? You know, it's the same thing where, you know, your mom spouts out, well, I heard this and I heard that and I heard this. You can be the proof to say that's not right. You're the proof. And to stay, stay steadfast with that is exactly what to do. So anybody else on that note? Okay. Um, eh, yeah. I always write stuff and then I just carry on and I have to catch up with myself. So um, um, a, a, little, a little tidbit on what I said I wasn't going to talk about. Um, Non-believers and believers together for a greater cause, how to be understanding and inclusive. So when writing these speeches, I don't know who's going to show up, you know, I don't know who's going to be here or who's going to haggle me or whatever. So um, I really try to stick to my guns on, on, my, on my word and uh, try, to, try to get to the point where I can say things that are kind of uh, conducive for both sides of the fence. And for me, it's, I've grown up on both sides of the believing and the non-believing. It's much easier to not be discriminated against if you don't go to church. There you go, it's easy. Don't believe in God. Don't believe in heaven or hell. Don't, don't be a faithful person if you don't feel it resides in your heart. But um, I hope that a lot of the things that I've said, um, specifically tonight, I tried to go a little bit away from the specific Christianity and transgenderism, uh, more so to how do we engage each other and how do we, how do we be more proficient in our conversations. Um, the thing I'll say about that is we have a lot of common differences, whether it's Christ or not. We always have the 1% we can turn to the 99. We can always start off on the right foot. We cannot be presumptuous about people's opinions because opinions create prejudice on our side of the fence as well and represent yourself in the way you want to be remembered. That has nothing to do with Christianity. That has everything to do with just being a good person. Um, I have a thing I call self-checkout. When I'm, when I'm thinking about the world, my situations, other people's situations, I put myself in self-checkout. Am I thinking about this accurately? Am I thinking of it from a, a Christian perspective when I need to and a non-Christian perspective when I need to? depending on the audience or the engagement, maybe. What I want to always be doing is doing my best, putting my best foot forward, and to try to remember that's all anyone's doing. No matter if you're coming from a church background or not, we're all simply just doing our best to try to understand the world around us as it's ever changing. And it changes in a blink of an eye. One day there's one description of something, the next day the description's changed. So how do we just give, yourself, give, give each other grace in that moment and say, oh, well, I, I actually heard that the updated whatever is this now. Oh, thank you for that information, move on. You know, it doesn't always have to be a debate. Um, using critical thinking. Are your sources accurate? Are your sources something you should be repeating? Are your sources something your Aunt Jenny told you or something that um, you can look up and have it be um, the same through several different sources. That's something we learned in early childhood development was to make sure your sources are accurate and that you're representing your sources well. You can't just throw in your opinion and then call it a fact. You have to read the whole damn article and then say, well, this is what the whole damn article had to say, not just, well, the header was this, and then I think this is what the rest of it is. So represent yourself in, in how you think and your critical thinking. Um, and Christianity doesn't make you a good person. It doesn't. You yourself and how you choose to act and represent yourself makes you a good person. And the way you want to be represented makes you, you a good person. Reading the Bible has, has little to nothing to do with being on, on point. You can, you can Bible aside, you can be the best Mother Teresa you darn well please. And it has nothing to do with Christianity. But I do firmly believe that Christianity, if you're on the right side of the street, will help you to understand people better and help you to understand where people are coming from when they resource the Bible against you. 
Um, we're getting to a time point now where I was not quite sure if I was going to make it through all this or not. Um, I want to go through one last thing, which is normalizing heterosexuality and transgender lifestyles in our world. And it's, it's very, very meek and mild here. But there's a, an extreme power struggle between the old and the new. And I think that that's what we're finding in our politics, where the old white guys had a lot of control for a long time. And the old white guys starting to realize, oh gosh, there's a whole lot of other people in this melting pot of our created Americas. And those people are starting to get a voice, and they're starting to get um, platforms. Um, Taylor Swift, what a wonderful lady. I don't listen to any of her music, but I do know that she uses her platform to give, give space for people that don't have space that are trying to be eradicated. And uh, the power struggle is going to be on and popping for a long time, because we have to get reform into our, our politics to say that people of a certain um, thought process don't, don't contribute to society. They, they contribute to the, the lack of society, if that. They want to control the population to make it what their comfort zone is. And that's what's happened since the dawning of time. The crusaders come in and wipe out all the people that challenge them. They wipe out the indigenous populations that they don't understand solely because they don't understand them. Well, history is repeating itself. We have people in politics now trying to wipe out what they don't understand, trying to falsify information about things that just simply isn't true. And you can go look up that it's not true. You can go fact check that these things are not true that are on the media against us right now. Um, being transgender is not a phase most of the time. That's a huge misconception. It's a phase, they'll get through it. I'll support them right now. They'll come out of it, we'll all be fine. Well, that's very comfortable. Um, introducing yourselves to new things is how we expand our minds and how we expand our abilities to understand different cultures, having cultural humility as we're understanding those cultures and saying, I don't know everything and I would love to learn. Putting yourself in that vulnerable position of learning. You know, we've all been in a classroom where you've had a question but you don't dare raise your hand because everybody might see you ask a question. Get over yourselves. That's not how you, how you get things done. And I encourage people to get their strength up and ask questions that are that are really positive questions that make change. When we're not introduced to new things, we live in a vacuum of space and time that only caters to our own understanding. And that's exactly what we're seeing with people that can't just simply learn what it is to be transgender or gay or, or bisexual or gender uh, non-conforming or et cetera, et cetera. They just don't want to deal with it. They want it gone. And so it's very important for our, us and our allies to say, we ain't going nowhere. And not only are we not going anywhere, but we're going to present our information strongly and, and in an affirmed way in our churches, in our cultures, in our societies, in our public groups, in our families to say, that guy that's always been on the outs that's gay in our family is no longer on the outs. That person's a, one of us and no different than any of us. So it's about using your, uh, using your intellect to not stay in that vacuum of space and that comfortability uncomfortability is where we learn. And that's the, the footprint we need to start making right there. Um, I'm just going to say, ask questions of each other in loving, caring terms. Do research to see if you're right. Vote, 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 vote. Make a positive, educated changes in local, state, and federal legislation. Pay close attention to your city councils and who's involved on them and what changes they want to make in your own town. Thank you, Megan, for being a great city councilwoman, by the way. The things that are up on the chopping block are book bans, anti-trans legislation, anti-trans health care for minors and adults. They're now trying to limit the care that adults, grown people, can make for themselves in our world right now. I, I, I'm not going to go down like that. So cultivate yourself to be a well-rounded, evenly tempered, well-mannered, and highly educated individual. The single best way to be a powerful person is to be educated. That's what I got tonight.